Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. I am going to be presenting the current status and future research questions for the CCI Biomass project on behalf of the entire team. Currently, we have produced maps of above ground vegetation biomass at a 100 meter resolution for 2010, 2017 and 2018 with an accompanying standard deviation layer. These maps have been derived using combinations of JAXA's ALOS PALSAR mission data and ESA's EMBASAT ASAR and Sentinel-1. Uh, this is obviously dependent on which year we're producing the map for and which data is available. Uh, in addition to this, we have used extra data from ISAC Glass, JEDI, CCI Land Cover, uh, vegetation continuous fields in order to inform on the retrieval that we're undertaking. And finally, in addition, we have worked on developing AGB change products which are yet to be released. As part of the project, we have undertaken a validation exercise. The plot data has been selected and harmonized following a rigorous criteria which is documented within our product validation plan. It has been split into three different tiers depending on the size and then also a fourth tier if you like with LIDAR data based, sorry, LIDAR data from Sustainable Landscape Brazil, NEON, TURN and COFOR. This validation data has been used to, to undertake an assessment for each tier at 100 meter resolution and 0.1 degree and then also with all of the tiers per biome at 0.1 degree. So the plots that you're seeing here are for that per biome validation uh, for 2017 on version 2 of our map. So we are very close to releasing version 3 of our products and we do see an improvement on the validation there, but I don't have the plots to show you just yet because it's still ongoing. So in this version two, despite seeing improvements from previous versions, we're still observing um, an under prediction in the high biomass area of the tropical and subtropical regions. Um, there is an improvement again on this in version three. Uh, we also see for example, in the tropical and subtropical dry broadleaf forest, that there is little correlation, but at the same time, we have very limited plot data for this biome, so it's difficult to draw any sort of conclusion on what we're seeing in that plot. Um, but overall, the validation does highlight that there are some limitations to the products, and these tend to be signal dependent and processing dependent. And given these, these uh, limitations, we are really strongly discouraging users to rely on the pixel-wise AGB values. In addition to this, we have been undertaking this change mapping. We're planning to release these change products in the summer of 2021. Again, we are strongly discouraging users to difference the AGB values at individual pixel level because of the errors and the uncertainties which were highlighted in the validation exercise. So the difficulties surrounding this change mapping and validation of change mapping is first and foremost, we don't have in situ data sets for multiple time periods across the regions of the entire globe. So it's very difficult to, to assess how reliable this, validate, this, this change product is. So what we're working on is the adjusting for bias in the static map products, but also looking at assessing the probability that the change that you're seeing in the change product is an actual change on the ground and a viable method for, for, for expressing that. And by, by looking at all these different elements, then we are trying to determine what the ideal resolution would be to produce a, vi a viable change product. And then, so finally, moving on, we are just coming to the end of phase one and we're going to be moving into phase two of the CCI Biomass project in the, in the near future. 
Um, phase two is going to focus on the long-term availability of biomass data. So we want to continue mapping on an annual basis, 2020, 2021. We're hoping that there can be an evolution from single maps to a continuous mapping over time. And in addition to this, we want to look at the potential to extend this into the past. So 2015, 2005, 1990s. And this is obviously dependent on what Earth observation data is available to us because we want to be able to maintain that intermap consistency for a, a harmonious data set across across all of the time periods that we're looking at. So as part of this, a lot of our focus is going to have to be on reducing the bias and improving the accuracy of these maps. So to gain that interannual or intermap consistency. For this, the validation activities are incredibly important, as is the in situ network and the availability of in situ data. And then alongside this, we're going to be further developing the change products and how they can be communicated, validated, assessed on a global scale. And we want to put effort into some use cases, so working to support countries also working with climate modelers and carbon modelers. And then finally, um, I'm sure this has been mentioned in some other presentations, but we're working alongside NASA and JAXA on a harmonization effort to produce a global product for 2020 that will be agreed upon as, as the map going forward into COP26. So that is it. Thank you ever so much for your attention. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Laura Duncanson and I'm presenting this talk on mapping biomass with the new LIDAR missions from NASA, JEDI and ISAT-2. I'm presenting this on behalf of a long list of authors, some of whom are noted here, um, who directly provided inputs for this presentation. So we have both NASA's JEDI and ISAT-2 on orbit uh, collecting LIDAR data. Uh, the biomass products from JEDI are forthcoming in the next few weeks, actually, uh, for the footprint level biomass and the gridded biomass will be following shortly thereafter. We already have uh, topographic products, um, canopy height, canopy cover, um, ground elevation from JEDI and uh, biomass will be following suit. Um, here is an animation of what the mission is. So this is a full waveform LiDAR mission. JEDI is about a refrigerator sized box plugged into the side of the Japanese experimental modules exposed facility on the International Space Station. And it has three lasers, uh, one of which is split into two beams, uh, creating four beams that are dithered back and forth, making eight ground tracks under the ISS. Each of these LiDAR pulses illuminates about a 25 meter diameter circle, which returns a full waveform, uh, this orange squiggle here, from which we can estimate the ground elevation, the canopy height, um, the, the LAI, uh, canopy cover, and importantly, above ground biomass. So how do we go from these waveforms to biomass? Um, we actually have collated a large international data set of um, hopefully globally representative field plots with airborne LiDAR that's coincident. So we take existing field plot data with airborne LiDAR that was flown or collected around the same time as the field plot data. We simulate waveforms from the LiDAR data, and then we fit empirical models, which we apply to on-orbit JEDI. So some of this data is quite old, some of it's quite new, all of it is useful, and this database will live and grow so that we can get better and better at estimating biomass from the waveforms over time. So here is our distribution of field plot data uh, with airborne LiDAR over it. Um, a lot of it's public, a lot of it uh, was shared with us for, um, for research purposes, but we wrote data sharing agreements so we can't release the orange stuff. And you can see that we do have some serious data gaps. So if you have data, uh, field data, airborne LiDAR data that fill some of these gaps, please do get in touch. We will continue to refit and improve our biomass models, which will improve our products as we move forward. Um, as you know, um, JEDI is only producing um, products up to 52 degrees latitude because the ISS does not go over the poles. So fortunately, we have NASA's ISAT-2, a photon counting LiDAR that is collecting 
um, LiDAR data at the same time as JEDI, but that covers the, uh, the full globe. Um, so we are making a biomass product in a similar way to what uh, what the Jedi mission is doing. Um, uh, this is a project led by myself and Amy Nguyen-Chwander on the ISAT2 science team. And we're taking field plot data and airborne LIDAR, making these ISAT2 biomass models and applying them to ISAT2 data north of 50 degrees latitude. So we'll compare Jedi and ISAT2 between 50 and 52 degrees north. Um, the main difference here is that we're processing the ISAT2 data at a 30 meter spatial resolution and linking it to Landsat for wall-to-wall -wall mapping. So this is a product that is coming out in the next few months. Uh, stay tuned, this will be out in 2021, along with the JEDI biomass products. So we will have these two NASA LiDAR focused products coming out in the relatively near future. But as you know from the other presenters, this is not the only way to make biomass maps. Um, and, uh, and with a forward looking gaze toward NASA ISRO's NISAR mission and ESA's biomass mission, we know we have a lot of uh, SAR capabilities on the horizon as well as, as at present. So often the LiDARs are used to actually train the SAR data for wall to wall mapping. Um, and so the best products we anticipate will actually be a fusion of many different data sources rather than um, primarily JEDI, primarily ISAT2, et cetera. Um, so we have a lot more products already and many, many more on the horizon. And this uh, creates a bit of a challenge for combining or comparing these products um, so data users won't get totally confused when there are 20 products out and they don't agree in their area of interest. Um, so to help circumvent this confusion, we developed a protocol, uh, the CIOS Working Group on CalVal's Land Product Validation, which was published in spring this year. This is guidance for map producers as well as map users to try to reduce some of the confusion in the community. So we're actually using this protocol for a new exciting activity, which is to combine the different uh, next generation biomass products um, for input to the UNFCCC's global stock take in 2023. So we have maps from JEDI, from ISAT2, from CCI Biomass, from JPL, and we're going to be taking them, trying to compare them in a consistent fashion, harmonize things like the definition of forest area, um, how people are doing uncertainties, and try to come up with some harmonized version of biomass products for policy applications. We're doing this on the NASA ESA multi-mission algorithm analysis platform, MAAP or MAP, which is an open science tool. One of the key elements of doing this type of harmonization intercomparison is transparency. Um, and so this is a tool that has been developed really to support open science and, uh, and collaboration across agencies. So we have all of these uh, active remote sensing data sets up in this, in this cloud-based tool that is totally open source. Um, so when we make a product on here or do some sort of uh, scientific analysis, like comparing products, all of the code becomes released with the final product. Our ISAT2 Boreal product is made on this platform. And so all of the source code for that will be released and available for the wider community, for anyone who wants to recreate the product. It's totally reproducible or just understand how we made it. Um, the same is true of the biomass harmonization activity. Thank you very much for your attention. You can follow Jedi on Twitter at Jedi Knights and my Twitter handle is here as well. Please get in touch with any questions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andres Espejo. I am a senior carbon finance specialist working for the World Bank. I'm going to present on remote sensing based estimation of forest carbon stocks and dynamics. Well, let's begin with the target. Uh, <clears throat> in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we will need to uh, decrease GHG emissions, annual GHG emissions by 50% by 2030 and net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, if you look at the commitments in the National Determined Contributions or NDC, uh, you know, basically this falls short of the above overall targets by between three and 6.2 gigatons of CO2 per year by 2030. Basically means that we are far from meeting this, this target. All this will require like an, in, an increase in ambition, uh, first of all, to meet the current NDCs, but secondly, to breach the existing gap that I, that I just mentioned. In order to meet, uh, to breach this existing gap and also I mean, increase this, this overall ambition, uh, the World Bank believes that result-based finance, including market-based mechanisms, uh, are necessary. Market-based mechanisms are basically, you know, paying for, uh, you know, carbon offsets that could be transacted and that basically would, um, 
<coughs> would incentivize uh, emission reductions. Well, one of the challenges in order to upscale carbon markets are basically is basically the, the current MRV system. The current MRV system or systems, basically they are slow, which delays uh, finance mobilization because uh, you know the MRV process or the MRV cycle can take between 12 to uh, 20 months. Um, the estimates provided by these MRV systems have a high uncertainty, which affects the quiet confidence on the quality of claims. Uh, thirdly, uh, there's a low standardization, which uh, causes or entails a challenge to fungibility and comparability of claims. So, for example, you might have you know, two MRV systems in two separate countries. They generate assets, but these assets are not comparable be between each other, but also they are not comparable with other sectors. And last but not least, the estimates are not especially explicit, which complicates reconciliation of claims. Now, you can have projects claiming that they have generated X emission reductions, but then at the higher level, uh, basically things they don't add up and they don't they don't match, which um, creates uh, lots of, of problems in in the markets and in this reconciliation of claims. So what happens with all this? All this basically reduces incentives for investors. It creates an imperfect uh, market and that cannot thrive and uh, cannot be uh, upscaled. So what is the solution for this? The solution would be an MRV 2.0. An MRV 2.0 is a digital centralized system that would provide special explicit estimates based on remote sensing or earth observation data. In order to better understand what is the state of the art of the different technologies, innovative technologies for remote sensing based estimation, what are the main challenges and what are the actions to be taken in order to make MRV 2.0 a reality, the World Bank launched a study back in 2020 and uh, concluded it in April 21 and uh, published the report that you that you are seeing on your right. These reports covers uh, four technology domains, remote sensing, geostatistics, artificial intelligence and cloud computing. And uh, as a result of, of the report, the World Bank prepared a policy brief which provides an overview of the paths towards an MRV 2.0. Well, if you look at the final reports, you will find some recommendations. Uh, some of these are relevant to research and development, and I'm going to summarize them uh, now. So first of all, in terms of data availability and access, one recommendation is to foster partnerships with research groups developing and maintaining in-situ plots. So in-situ plots are the cornerstone of MRV 2.0, and basically we need to, to work on that, make a, a data you know, more accessible, support the different groups in order to uh, maintain and, um, and implement the new plots. And GeoTrees is, uh, is, an, is an example uh, you know, um, that has is led, it's been led by the research and development community, which is a step in the right direction. Then in terms of processing and computational performance, there are many recommendations here. So uh, basically the conclusion of the report is that in artificial intelligence, including computer vision and geostatistics, there are many solutions to the problems that are identified in, in current approaches and remote sensing. So for instance, um, uh, something related to uncertainty management I, I will cover in the next point. So in terms of uncertainty management, um, uh, well, one recommendation is to pilot implementation of geostatistical and artificial intelligence solutions through demonstration activities. So uh, this is the thing that I was going to point out. Um, in, there are many challenges that are identified by currently by the research and development community working on remote sensing in the production of biomass maps. One of these challenges is related to uncertainty management, and there are solutions in geostatistics and artificial intelligence to those, uh, those problems that are identified. Something that I didn't mention that is, uh, we find quite crucial is that there should be like a strengthening of the research and development community working on remote sensing and, uh, and those working in geostatistics and AI which uh, apparently historically there has been um, uh, well, a, a normal division that happens uh, all the time, but it, it would be important to reinforce these uh, collaborations. Fourthly, standardization and protocols. These are the development of standards and protocols for data collection and development of components of the system is a, is a very uh, important point. The, the creation of the biomass protocol is, a, is the right step in the, is a good step in the right direction. And um, 
and uh, but this should be extended to other steps of the whole process, um, including you know, other developments of the systems like you know processing in the in the cloud, or even integration of uh, uh, other solutions from the AI and uh, and the geostatistics world. Last but not least, enabling environment. So as I was mentioning earlier, support to data policies for access and sharing, whether it's in situ data and remote sensing data, whether it's uh, data, in situ data coming from countries, research uh, and development community, etc. Uh, and finally, establish communication among experts and users. As I was mentioning, it's very important to uh, enhance the collaboration between the research and, the, and well, the remote sensing uh, um, uh, researchers and uh, and those researchers in artificial intelligence and geostatistics. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to this workshop. My name is Natalia Mala, and I would like to share with you today the research that I'm currently doing as part of my PhD with the University of Wageningen, which addresses tropical country needs. So first of all, I would like to start to address the question of why we are exploring the use of these global biomass mass in national above ground biomass estimates. So as you may know, there are these evolving technologies and guidelines for the use of biomass maps in the greenhouse gas uh, country reports as well as MRV uh, accounting systems. That there is still the need for country case studies that allow us to better understand the country operational and technical challenges from the use of such information. At the same time, countries in the tropics are the ones who struggle the most to either complete their first national forest inventory or to assure their continuity. I was reading the other day Peru's red reference uh, emission level submission, the latest one, and there they stated the need for better or more complete biomass estimates while their NFI was still incomplete. And finally, to fulfill the principle of accuracy from the IPCC, it would be better to understand how to account for these different sources of uncertainties coming from the integration of Earth observation products with NFI information for country reports. I think this is also a need that has been reflected in some country, country needs. For the purpose of this study, we assess the gain of precision in above ground biomass estimates from the use of global biomass maps through three different scenarios. So the first scenario, the, which we call the baseline scenario, is where we replicated the country estimates consistently with the original NFI statistical inference strategy, so no map scenario. On the second scenario, we incorporated the global biomass map, formulated and calibrated using informal information external to the area of interest, that means non locally calibrated. Here, we selected the map closest in time to the country case study NFI implementation period to avoid any temporal harmonization. On the third scenario, on the last one, we first fitted a regression model between the above ground biomass S reference data, the NFI, and the above ground biomass map values to locally calibrate the global biomass map before addressing the estimations. Here, we also accounted for the different sources of uncertainty that come from the integration of remote sensing products with NFI data, which I will address again in the coming slide. We implemented this research through two country case studies. On one hand, we wanted to compare the contribution of the map on two different biomass scenarios. We had dry tropical forests and woodlands uh, with low biomass in Tanzania against humid tropical forests with higher biomass in the Peruvian Amazonia. On the other hand, we also used two different methodological approaches to integrate the auxiliary data into our estimates. Here you can see the plot configuration in both countries. Although both cases use sampling units following an L shape, Tanzania works with clusters of 10 circular plots distance uh, at least 250 meters from each other. Whereas in Peru, the NFI uses plots with subplots, where the subplots are much closer together, at least 30 meters, and therefore they are presumably spatially correlated. To address that, we selected uh, statistically rigorous estimators, and to do so, we relied mostly on probability sampling strategies. So to assess this plot to map assessment, 
Um, on Tanzania, we did it from these circular plots that you see there directly to the pixel level. Whereas in Peru, to accommodate for this spatial correlation of the, uh, within the subplots, we actually use or recreated this or use a whole plot configuration from the, from the entire L. So these, let's say, 10 circular subplots against a polygon of a map pixels that circumscribe the plot. That is that we aggregated the map pixels to at least 40, 400 by 400 blocks. As I mentioned before, on the third scenario where we are using our locally calibrated biomaps maps to build our predictions, we also accounted for the source of uncertainty coming from the integration of the map with the NFI data. These three sources of uncertainty include the measurement error coming from the errors measuring DVH, wood density and the allometric equation itself, the within block variability uh, that is the effect of the plot having a smaller size than our circumscribed polygons from the map. And the last one is a geolocation error or positional error coming or related with the GPS accuracy. So here I'm presenting some preliminary results from Peru where you can see that coefficient of variation or the contribution from these errors is, for instance, much smaller in, in terms of the positional error or the allocation, geolocation error in comparison to the within block variability, which is this third column on the right. So we also have some preliminary results of Peru. So far, we have been able to replicate uh, from the three scenarios, the first one, the baseline scenario, where we are just replicating the NFI estimates. On the second scenario, where we build the predictions from a locally uncalibrated biomass map, which is the, the second one in the middle. Uh, but in the terms of, of the third one, and to assess the contribution in precision of the map assisted predictions from a locally calibrated biomass map, at this point, we are still about to complete this scenario because we were still deciding until recently on how to integrate this three sources of uncertainty that I just mentioned in our estimates. Uh, but we expect that the relative precision is enhanced, which could translate in more efficient or reduced country NFI sampling intensity. And lastly, within the discussion of this paper, we are planning to address these operational challenges from the integration of the biomass maps with NFI data. For instance, in terms of data harmonization can be in, in terms of temporal harmonization, but also resolution wise. Uh, the fact of using these plots from the NFI are usually quite small or like in Peru, using these plots with subplots or using these nested plots where mostly three dBH is, is sampled with different intensity within the plot, among other issues that uh, came up during our analysis. And finally, as a common activities, we are planning to use these enhanced locally calibrated biomass maps to spatially predict above ground biomass in the Peruvian Amazon uh, in order to address uh, also a, a country need related with the use of these maps to allow to differentiate emissions and removals from deforestation and degradation. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm leaving my email address here for any questions that you have, and I also will be around in the discussion for, for any questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Joanna, and I'm happy to take this opportunity here in this biomass session to reflect on the role of biomass-based data and derived products for supporting climate change mitigation actions. Global Earth observation products seem very promising to monitor and report greenhouse gas emissions in the land sector and to be used in all these elements of the Paris Agreement. But to come up with a concrete plan for the enhancement of the uptake of these products, one valuable exercise is to explore two sets of information available. The IPCC guidelines that list the equations and variables to be used by countries and existing reporting with insight on if and how Earth observation data are used for each one of these variables. Because the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement that will supersede the MRV procedures is not in place just yet, we can use evidence from the current MRV framework, and REDD Plus provides valuable information for this exercise. 
So first, what are the methods, equations and variables in the IPCC guidance that countries need data for? If using the default gain-loss method, the reporting main variables are the initial change in carbon stock from a land conversion. This is measured with the area of land for each stratum and the biomass in the strata before and after conversion, the B before and B after. For both land conversions and for land remaining in the same land category, we also need information on the annual increases in biomass due to growth, the delta CG, and annual decreases in biomass due to harvest, fuel wood removal, and mortality or losses due to other disturbances, the delta CL. The alternative stock difference method can be used if we have measurements of carbon stock at two points in time to assess carbon stock changes. But it is important to make sure the differences are due to changes in biomass and not area. So from this overview of variables, it seems clear that there are opportunities for existing and planned Earth observation datasets to improve the accuracy and the completeness of the estimates, and also to help overcome data limitations that can determine the use of several simplifying Tier 1 assumptions, such as 100% oxidation at the time of conversion, meaning ignoring lagged emissions, or regrowth following deforestation or disturbance, and that the post-deforestation carbon stock is zero. Okay, so we know the variables we need data for, and there seems to be an opportunity to use Earth observation datasets for these reporting variables, but are countries using existing datasets as source of information in their reporting to the Convention? I'm using Red Plus to answer this question because it is one of the elements of the Paris Agreement and also because the Red Plus decisions established that forest reference levels and greenhouse gas inventories should be harmonized in terms of data, methodologies and procedures used. So the capacity to use Earth observation data for reporting in the context of Red Plus is evidence of the capacity to use it in greenhouse gas inventories and in future BTRs and consequently the global stock take. Also because although many non-annex 1 countries have never submitted a greenhouse gas inventory for Red Plus, 54 countries have submitted at least one forest reference level and collectively these cover over 1.5 billion hectares of forest. There are valuable lessons from the almost 10 years of Red Plus under the convention. In terms of Earth observation data use, we can clearly see preferences in users and trends, but here what we can see is that countries use satellite data as the main source of information for activity data to quantify deforestation mostly, but also other Red Plus activities, such as the enhancement of forest carbon stocks and forest degradation, and also as secondary data, for example, for training and validation. For these components, the preferred sources of data are Landsat and imagery access through the Collect Earth platform or Google Earth. But global products are also used, in particular or mainly the global forest change product from Matt Hansen was used in 22 submissions. Interestingly, there is an almost negligible use for fire mapping and to derive emission factors. Although pantropical biomass maps have been available for a decade, they were not used. Most countries prefer to rely on their national forest inventory data based on field plot measurements. If an NFI is not available, some national project-based field data or IPCC defaults are used instead. There are many potential factors that can hinder the uptake of these products, and here we can reflect on the potential technical limitations by linking the reporting variables to products characteristics and considering national circumstances or requirements. So data requirements such as spatial and temporal resolutions and temporal coverage vary depending on how the product is used for each specific IPCC variable, but other conditions must also be met or considered. So here is an example highlighting the importance of national definitions when considering the spatial resolution requirement. We have a 1 km resolution biomass map that gives us at least the mean biomass of woozy vegetation in this pixel. However, the reality in this, in this pixel 100 hectare unit can be far from homogeneous. In this example, the minimum area that defines forest and land is 1 hectare, and the biomass value in this pixel will include two different forest types and also trees outside forests, so tree crops, fruit trees, trees left in croplands, and also urban trees. So the country needs biomass information for each one of these land uses and strata. In this example, the value from this pixel is not representative of any of these strata. 
That does not mean that the product cannot be used to derive the b before or the b after. It can, but it needs to use uh, air, larger homogeneous areas and not heterogeneous areas like this one. Other considerations are very important for the uptake of products, such as the temporal coverage and the, cap the capability to provide information on bias and precision and consistency of data and methods used across time. Some key messages. So the requirements vary depending on the variable, depending on how we use the product to derive information on that variable, and depending on national circumstances. And also, it's important to keep in mind that to move from an abstract idea or objective to concrete enhancement of the uptake of satellite-based data and derived products, there are very valuable lessons from the current MRV process and valuable information in the reporting from countries and in the reports from the technical assessment or technical analysis or the soon-to-be technical expert review cycles, namely in the section of future areas of improvement. Well, so thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. The problem pertains to the data used to construct biomass models, particularly tropical biomass models. The underlying assumption is that good data for constructing tropical biomass models are generally not available, so that we often have to use whatever data are available. The issue is that these available data are seldom harmonized with respect to key features such as minimum tree diameter, plot size, and plot shape. The first issue pertains to minimum tree diameter. Obviously, if we have a minimum diameter that's smaller for the same size plot, we're gonna get more biomass, where if, if the minimum diameter is larger, we're gonna get less biomass for the same plot. The second issue pertains to plot size. If data comes from different plot sizes, they may not be comparable. In particular, larger plots, we know have greater diversity. We also know that larger plots have smaller ranges of biomass per unit area. This figure depicts a situation in which a tree center may be inside the plot, but a large branch hangs outside the plot, or conversely, the tree center is outside the plot, but a large branch hangs inside the plot. When we measure a plot, we measure whole trees. So if the tree center is inside, we capture the whole tree, including the branch hangs that hangs outside. Similarly, if the plot tree center is outside the plot, we don't catch any of the tree regardless of the branch hangs inside. So when we measure the plot, we may get portions of trees that are outside the plot. We will miss portions of trees outside the plot that hang inside the plot. When we calculate a LIDAR metric, it corresponds to exactly the plot perimeter. So that the LIDAR metric may not really correspond to the biomass that's inside the plot, okay? The issue is that square plots have greater perimeter area ratios than circular plots, meaning that this overhang problem becomes more important for square plots. So the question then is, what are the consequences of using these kinds of unharmonized data? First of all, and secondly, if there are consequences, how can we avoid them or circumvent them without losing too much data? But there were a few points that I wanted to bring up, especially when it comes to the tropical regions. And then how do we really um, um, develop maps and also um, verify those? I think one of the key issues that we have found out over the past um, several years that we've been generating maps over the tropical forests has been that we have measurements of the forest structure coming from different remote sensing data sets, uh, specifically LIDAR. And, and then we use some models to convert these LIDAR data sets to biomass. And I did it in 2011, and uh, Bacini did it a uh, similar time frame, and then later on others have also produced these maps. And the key issue was the models that we developed to convert the LIDAR data to biomass um, was very general models that we basically tried to use the airborne LIDAR data sets and the plot data 
um, to develop these relationships. And we found out later on that these relationships have uh, created some spatial patterns over the tropical regions that um, do not completely match. And one of the reasons these spatial patterns were coming was because of the structure. And, um, and not so much because of the biomass itself. So there are two distinctions, the distinction between the structure itself, which is the forest height or volume, uh, more accurately than the, the biomass. And that distinction was the variations of the species composition across the tropical regions. This variation impacts the wood density variations. The wood density variation comes in as a, uh, as a kind of um, multiplicative factors on the structure. So I think it's very important when we look at mapping to really make sure that we capture this. And this can be done either directly um, using our remote sensing data sets with the biomass that is being uh, collected across these wood density variations to train and calibrate those, or have some level of um, wood density variations to really help to correct these uh, um, biomass estimations. And I think when we do the bias correction, we will see that. In, for example, in the Amazon, going from the uh, Guyana Shields on the northeast all the way to the southern Peruvian regions, you might have a factor of 30% you know, difference in the wood density uh, variations from something from average of 28 to um, so I think that's the one key thing that we need to think about um, in terms of developing models and then evaluating those models systematically. The, I think the second thing is um, from plot to map and from remote sensing data sets to map. And um, by remote sensing data sets, I mean if we have airborne LIDAR data or um, data sets from drones, anything that it's kind of a remote sensing in with a defined biomass or a structure and pixel level. We learn that often we get very good relationship between one estimated remote sensing to another estimated remote sensing compared to the plot data to remote sensing. And the reason for that is with, with, with comparing two remote sensing estimates of biomass, we often uh, avoid the problem of where the data coming from, meaning the pixel. The pixels can be matched perfectly. And whereas with the plot, depending on the size of the plot and other issues associated with it, and when the plot was taken and the referencing issues, there is a large uncertainty that comes in. And I think maybe we will talk about this. And recently, what folks at the University of Bagamini and others in Europe have done in terms of uh, plot to map. Um, uh, protocols and they've been taking care of this thing. And so I think that's another issue. And that brings me to the third point that I want to make that across the tropics now, there is a large data set of urban uh, LIDAR data that can be used as reference if it's calibrated and the errors can be populated um, systematically. That data set can help us to actually calibrate our biomass or our estimations of the biomass uh, globally. And this includes both in the Brazilian Amazon, both South America, Congo Basin, and Southeast Asia. And I think we could probably use those resources. And I think countries um, have capabilities in a lot of areas to have urban data sets. And so we can do that either on the project level or even at the larger scale for kind of 